video game Genshin Impact, also known as the God of Wind. Besides being able to control the wind, I can also create wind currents to lift me up and create tornadoes. Hello everyone and welcome to the 10th annual Schomburg Black Comic Book Festival. I'm Joy Bivens and I have the pleasure and privilege of serving as the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and the privilege of extending this welcome to you today. The festival was founded in 2012 and since that time it has grown to be one of the city's most exciting events for comic book lovers, creators, and consumers from all over the country. This year, as you know, the festival is virtual and takes place over three days. During that time, you can engage with this incredible community of Black artists, writers, and illustrators in panel discussions, workshops, and more. If you haven't already done so, please do check out the full schedule at our website, shamcom.org. And since you're here, you probably already registered, but if you haven't done that either, please take a minute to do so by clicking the registration button on the website and sign up. It's free and you only have to do it once for the whole festival. You can catch every session of the festival, even ones you missed at shamcom.org. Part of the joy of the festival is the opportunity to discover, to discover pardon me, new Black comic book artists, and to buy and read their work. And this year, we've arranged virtual booths for a number of the artists on our website on the exhibitors page. Additionally, the Schomburg has a bookstore, so you can click on our booth to see the Black comic books that we have in store as well. If you've been to the festival before, you know that every year we have a fabulous cosplay showcase where people dress up as their favorite comic book characters and strut their stuff on the Schomburg Center stage. This year, we compile cosplay video submissions for a virtual showcase that will be available for viewing throughout the programs and on our website, so you should look out for that. Also, to celebrate the festival's 10th year, tomorrow we will open the exhibition Boundless 10 years of seeding Black comic book comic futures at the Schomburg Center. So you'll be able to see that exhibition in person. Boundless marks this important milestone in the creation of the Schomburg Center for Research Black and Black Cultures, Black Comic Book Festival. It does this by offering an in-depth look behind the scenes at the festival's creation through profiles, photographs, memorabilia, and it also features objects from the Schomburg's rich collections. Lastly, I want to thank our ASL interpreter and live captioner for joining us. Viewers, if you have questions or comments for panelists, they will be glad to answer them and acknowledge them. Please send them anytime using the chat feature. And I want to extend my personal gratitude to every member of the staff who has given their time and talent to making this festival a success, even during a pandemic. So pre-congratulations to all of you. And now it's time for our very first session, which will be moderated by festival organizer and manager of education programs, Katia Tu Tubman. Lifting As We Climb, a Black comic book festival story looks back 10 years ago to the genesis of the Schumburg Center's Black Comic Book Festival. That time it started with a mission to introduce young black and brown people to books that represented, that represented them, pardon me. As we know, today the event has become one of the country's premier spaces for black comics, reaching audiences as local as Harlem and as distant as Lagos, Nigeria. This panel will feature festival founders, John Jennings, Jonathan Gales, Deidre Holman, as they reflect on the legacy of this annual event. 
I hope you do enjoy everything. And now I would like to turn it over to Katie Atu for this first panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy, for that wonderful introduction. And welcome everyone to the 10th annual Black Comic Book Festival. I'm your moderator for today's program as, as well as the organizer of the festival for the past four years. My name is Katie Atu Tubman. Like I said, I'm the manager of education programs at the Schomburg Center. And I am so excited and thrilled to be in conversation with three people who I absolutely adore and admire, not only for their work, but their activism and their work as educators. So I will start off by just reading off introductions. So forgive me for like my shifty eyes, because I'm going to be reading off of a Word doc and <laughs> trying to keep focus on this Zoom camera that we're in, in this whole pandemic universe. So first, I would like to start with Jonathan Gales. Jonathan is a professor and chair of African American Studies at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. He has primary area of focus and interest include the anthropology of education, educational policy, Black masculinity, race and ethnicity, and critical media studies. He produced award-winning documentary on African American comic book superheroes called White Scripts and Black Superheroes, Black Mascul Masculinities in Comic Books. The award-winning documentary is distributed by California Newsreel. More information on the film can be found at blacksuperherodoc.com. Next, we have John Jennings, who is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside. Jennings is co-editor of the Esner Award-winning collection, The Blacker the Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art. Jennings is also a 2016, 2016 Nasir Jones Hip Hop Studies Fellow with the Hutchkins Center of Harvard University. Jennings' current projects include the horror anthology Box of Bones, the coffee table book Black Comics Return with Damian Duffy, and the Eisner winning Bram Stoker award winning New York Times best selling graphic novel adaptation of Octavia Butler's classic dark fantasy novel Kindred, one of my absolute favorites. Jennings is also the founder and curator of Abrams' Megascope line of graphic novels. And next, Deidre Hol Holman, my sister friend, my girl, we go way back. <laughs> Deidre Holman is an Afrofuturist educator, cultural producer, and doctoral student at Teachers College, Columbia University. Her research focuses on critical social studies curriculum and teaching, as well as historical, racial, visual, and speculative literacies. Her article, Critical Race Comics, Teaching Black Subjective and Racial Literacy, was recently published in the Journal of Curriculum and Pedagogy. She is the founder of the Black Comics Collective, a live events digital and publishing forum for connecting comic creators of color with the community that craves them. She is also the former director of education and exhibitions at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, where she served for 15 years. And I want to add, we are, we are missing one of our incredible founders today who is not able to be a part of this conversation, but I would be absolutely remiss to, to not just give a huge shout out and express deep love and appreciation for Jerry Kraft, one of our, our four founders of this festival. And, I, and to do that and to honor him, I would like to read his bio. Jerry Kraft is the New York Times bestselling author and illustrator of the graphic novels, New Kid and Class Act. New Kid is the only book in history to win the John News Newberry Medal for the most outstanding contribution to children's literature in 2020, the Kirkus Prize for Young Readers Literature in 2019, and the Coretta Scott King Award for the most outstanding work by an African-American writer in 2020. Kraft is also the creator of Mama's Boys, an award-winning comic strip, which won the African-American Literary Award five times. He received his BS, BFA from the School of Visual Arts. Thank you all. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Deidre, for joining me in conversation today. Welcome our ama amazing founders and our panelists for this conversation. Good to see everybody. Thank you. So great to be here. Thank you, Katie, too. You're absolutely welcome. I mean, I when we started, you know, backstage, when we started talking, I, I when you all said 10 years, you know, did you imagine getting to 10 years? And someone asked me that the other day and I'm just like, 
I don't think we ever imagined time, like what a time milestone will be, but I'm wondering what you, each of you, I would love to hear what, what are you feeling in this moment? Um, especially given the, con the conditions we're in, the pandemic, um, and, and considering this anniversary and how much of an importance it is to so many people, writers, artists, independent artists, um, teachers even, mm -hmm. what does this anniversary mean for each of you? Deidre, I'll defer to you since you were at I the show. Like, I was thinking the same thing. I was, I was like, like, no, 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 no. I think because because she was on the ground in the right. state, I think, you know, we should, Deidre should start. I agree. I agree. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you. I'll start. And I'll start by saying that the first year that we put together the festival, um, we literally, as Jerry used the metaphor, we voltron it. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing together all of our networks collectively and our expertise and with the great support of the then director of the Schomburg, Khalil Mohammed, to just go for it and see what we could do to, to, to cobble together, you know, not only a scholarly panel and a movie screening and vendors and workshops and do all the community work that we did. Um, and so we were very much focused on the first one and we were surprised and said, okay, I guess we should do it again. <laughs> and we were able to refine the model and to get more support from community and, and it built organically in that way. And so to see 10 years having um, the Schomburg Center sustaining this very important program and seeing kind of the opportunity for legacy, like every two or three years or new batches of artists who mm -hmm. debut at the Schomburg Center and, and to watch careers grow and to watch young people, you know, graduate high school and go pursue, you know, uh, media and art related uh, fields. It's really quite amazing. So I have to give my uh, cred to give, uh, lay down my hat and flowers to the Schomburg Center and to you, Katie Atu, who even after, you know, I stepped away from the center, you picked up the baton and sustained this pro very important program. So 10 years means a it's lot, but it's, it's the Schomburg Center's commitment to the programming. Yeah, for sure. I, I think for me, reflecting on 10 years, I can remember the moment in the first year where I was, you know, Schomburg is phenomenal. So if you haven't been there, you have to get there. And I remember, going up on the second floor and looking down on the balcony and just realizing how many people were there. And it struck me that, you know, sometimes when you're working in this space and it's no longer the case now, but at, the, the, at that point, you, you could easily feel alone. That's okay, you're doing something with comic books or graphic novels or popular culture. And it was so validating for me but then I also realized that all of those people that were coming were also being validated in much more important ways. And then the second year, I remember the line that it was snowing <laughs> and the, the, the line was literally around the block. And it hit me that this, this has nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. This is something that people need, you know, to see themselves reflected in whole and humane ways. And now, 10 years later, thousands of thousands and thousands of people, both directly and indirectly in person, virtually have been impacted by this, this festival. I, I, you know, I, I just, I'm, I don't have a sufficient vocabulary to describe how, how proud, I, proud I am just to be uh, associated with it. Uh, thank you both for that. I, you know, I, um, wow. It, I, talk, I talk about the festival quite a bit because it's, it's such a huge part of, my work as um you know in, in pedagogy but also as a, as a critical maker as a designer um what what jonathan and deirdre are saying is like just totally on on the on the mark i mean i was just surprised that people were coming at first i was like wait a minute there's actual people coming to the space what you know and, and i remember like a similar feeling uh jonathan well i'm looking around it's like they're actually like this is actually working you know and you know, I should be uh, thankful to you, Jonathan, for contacting me about uh, about this. This is also the 10th anniversary of me and Stacey Robinson's uh, Black Kirby. Uh, Black Kirby. 
Yeah, yeah, we're doing a 10th anniversary show here at the Riverside, actually, and also celebrating the work of Larry Fuller, uh, uh, based off of uh, Evan as well. And, um, you know, we had a pop-up uh, uh, um, uh, exhibition that, that was uh, engineered by Jonathan and Deirdre uh, in that space. And, um, you know, it, it was really like a turning point in a lot of different ways for me as a, just the way I was thinking about my work. I mean, I don't know how many people have been through that space now. I mean, probably tens of thousands. So I don't even, I don't know what the, what the number is, but what's really interesting about it is that we have like a whole generation or, or like a whole cadre cohort, I don't know what the mm -hmm. right word is, of, of, of kids, Black kids, you know, who, who have seen themselves reflected in the work and, and in, in the entrepreneurship and in the characters who, who never have to know what it's like to not be subject of a narrative. Mm -hmm. and that's extremely powerful. You know, when we were coming up, of course, you know, you you might see a black character here or there. There are lots of black characters out there, but you know, how many characters are being like at the center of the narrative, or or, or this story is about them, but they're not the sidekick, they're not dying person, a story, story. Like the 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 subjectivity uh, of blackness has been shifted because of this event, and that's that's a really powerful thing that we've redefined what that looks like. You know, for an entire cohort of kids and a, an entire cohort of creators. And the last thing I want to add is that there are people who come to this festival who are now superstars, who've moved into like a new echelon and a new uh, area of, of, of their own careers because of the fact that this that they've touched this festival. And that is um, an incredible legacy that I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of. Man, I really, wow. Thank you all for that. I really appreciate your comment, especially John, you're absolutely right. The The community that's been, you know, not only birth through this event, but like expanded from this event has been incredibly powerful to just witness um, in the past couple of years for me, just four or five years, but for you all for 10 years, that's a decade of change. So I love when I talk about the festival, like I constantly, at least lately, I refer to it as a movement. Like it's even mm -hmm. bigger than, than just an event and a program. This is, this is a movement. This is something that's stronger, that has deep also political implications, um, especially when it comes to social change. And, and that kind of wants, I want to bring to my, my next question, because oftentimes I've been doing a lot of these um, interviews about the event and, and why it's important. And it's been challenging me to really like get to the heart of it, but there's not one single heart. Everyone wants that one reason why this event exists. Um, but I would love, especially thinking about your work, Jonathan, and, and all of you in, in academia and how we, like you said, John, how we shift how we think about black subjectivity and black subjects. I'm curious just in general to think of, if you could give me ideas of what are the needs you wanted to fill with this event? Or if there were needs, what if there were just wants? We, sometimes we always think about like, I, we need this, we need representation. I'm just like, yeah, representation, yes, yes. But there's also more, like what, what is the more? Like what do we not only need for our community specifically and for the world, but what, 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 what wants were like, were met through this event uh, through something like the Black Comic Book Festival. Right. So, and I think I said that only because Jonathan, I love your scholarship on like masculinity, gender, race, and it's just like it's deeper than you know. So, sorry to cut you off, Jonathan. Go ahead. No, no, no problem. Yeah, we were talking about this backstage virtually, and it, the first year I I was not yet. Wait a minute. Let me make. Yeah, I wasn't yet a father, right? No, yes, I was. I had a baby, 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 right. baby, 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 girl, right? <laughs> and and for me, you know, and I need to give John credit for something. So I, I struggled with the title of the documentary, and it was John Jennings that gave me the title White Scripts and Black Superman. So I want to think about the idea of white scripts, right? And so for me, the work and the, the festival was about taking ownership of those scripts and also attending critically to those scripts. Because if you're not careful, you are engaging these scripts in many different ways, and you don't realize that these are scripts that are being written for you, not written by you. So it's not just about creating your own scripts, it's also attending critically to other scripts, right? And so that the first festival, and it continues to the present, was, was primarily in my mind about the vendors, elevating these people doing this important work, but it was also about the scholarship. And, and I, you know, I've said, Deidre and John have heard me and Jerry have heard me say this. I feel like an outsider because I'm not a creator. I, I, I'm, I'm not that talented in that space. But I also know that balance between a critical eye and also the critical sort of creative process 
is important. So that's what I wanted. And now as a, as a father to two black girls, growing up in a world in which the, the black body is still regarded in so many ways that demean the, their potential ability to live whole, again, whole and humane life, life, I want us to continue to engage in this kind of critical media literacy. And so again, it's not simply critiquing, but it's also creating, it's both. And that's what I, I wanted in the festival. I can remember those conversations Deidre, you and I had about the importance of vendors, right? Mm -hmm. And also the importance of panels, the importance of workshops. I wanted all of that. And, and thanks to the Schomburg and thanks to you, Katie, too, and the folks that work with you, I believe that the, the, the festival is, is accomplishing all of those very important goals. And I can build right off of that because it's the it's those critical conversations that come through black art and culture right that are very important and so my want was for the young people that you know we were serving in the junior scholars program 150 middle and high school students who were you know at the time really taken um by anime and manga mm. to see black creativity in this space and so as i linked up with these esteemed gentlemen that became possible for them not only to look at films that had that critical lens on the genre but to meet the people who were crafting the stories and illustrating you know our you know physicalities in all kinds of spaces, like in, in all kinds of worlds. People who were literally imagining new universes um, that included um, black and brown people. So it was not just representation flat, like, okay, brown, you know, black folks in comics, but it was like the diversity of representation and, and that creative production of our image, taking control of our images um, that I wanted young people to learn from and be inspired by. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, you know, and first, first of all, on the vending side, I just remember like so many nights, like working with Jerry, like with seating charts and trying to figure <laughs> out the design of, of, of the space and, uh, you know, basically trying to make the Schomburg into something that wasn't designed to be actually the Schomburg, you know? Um, yeah, because it's, 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 the space is not designed to be the thing that it is, and it just morphs, it, it, it transforms into like this amazing nexus of, of information uh, and, 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 and uh, joy, you know, for everybody that comes through there. And, um, you know, it's interesting, like uh, the cohort of folk who created, you know, who, who helped found the, the space, myself and and uh, my esteemed colleagues, we're all now critical makers. You know, that's something really interesting too. You know, start like take the critical thinking, and sometimes it, it doesn't manifest itself as a paper or as a book. You know, sometimes it manifests itself as an art object or, or a teaching device, like a film or like you know a collective of people that are making things. So, one of the things that's really interesting to me, um, um, I remember I remember this uh, uh, this uh, interview I saw with Bell Hooks, a God Rester, and. Um, and uh, Theaster Gates. And Theaster Gates was talking about the fact that he's a potter and he was making, you know, he has this MFA uh, in, in making of things. He got this, what does the MFA give you? It gives you a certain set of skills and a way of looking at the world, right? And so when I saw that interview, I realized that the four of us, along with the Schomburg, were designing a future. We were actually using the space and designing an experience and the deliverable, you know, as a designer, I think about deliverables all the time. I think about what is the end goal? Like, what is this object that we're making? The deliverable is a set of, is, is, a, is a type of person, a, a kid or a student or, or, or a festival goer who now has an unfettered imagination, you know, after coming into the space. Like, there are no limitations. And so when you, when you walk into that space and you see individual uh, entrepreneurs who created characters that look like you, you know, using the technologies and, and, and showing you the way. I mean, it's just, I don't know. It, it, there, there's nothing to describe like how that feels to me, you know, uh, like, and, and now as, as a father too, I, I see in my son the potentials of what can be possible even more so. I think, you know, we keep talking about Afrofuturism. I think it's one of the most Afrofuturist uh, uh, ideas, right? To, to make sense of the past, like, you know, like a lot of the work that we've done as historians and educators, but also how that relates to the future. All these different things are connected, you know? 
And um, I think early on, the four of us saw the potential uh, for change. We had no idea that we'll get to this point, but uh, you know, I think that the earnestness and the, the diligence that we put into the, the program um, has paid off and, and, I, and it still will pay off for like generations, I think. Mm -hmm. I'll just toss into that. Um, one of the things that Jerry would talk about often um, as he was the organizer of Black Comic Book Day at Human Bookstore in Harlem okay. is that with the diminishing number of bookstores, let alone Black bookstores in our culture at large, you know, in the last 20 years, um, spaces to convene people around books and comics um, were just not available. And the big comic cons, um, there were there were barriers to entry, you know, for people of color. There might be one panel that was the diversity panel or or the hip hop panel, right. <laughs> but you know that's one conversation around you know hundreds of IP. So like now the Schomburg, which it has always done since it opened its doors, created a platform for hundreds of conversations focused on our you know on Black history, culture, and, and comics. So that's what's really cool as yeah, well. I thank you for adding that, especially the context for the Black his, the Black Comics Day that was that was a precursor for this this amazing event. Um, I was I couldn't I latched my brain immediately latched onto your invoking of bell hooks, um, John, um, because all of you mentioned criticality in in just the work you're doing and in my work as an educator, I'm always pushing, like we had to get our young people critically thinking about the, the medias they, the, they consume, the, the information they consume, like the knowledge, the production of knowledge, like we always gotta be critical of it. And so I have to take my a step back because I'm, I'm demanding this of them. Um, but at the same time, I have to introduce them to people who've taught me how to be critical because I think the dominant culture, it's, it's easy to just, you know, go along with, you know, hegemony and dominant culture and just be like, this is the way things are until someone breaks away from it saying, you know, like the matrix, like breaks away from it saying like, this is something's wrong. Something's not right. Um, we got to be critical about what's really happening to us, especially as black people in America and throughout the world. And so my question is more specifically because I, I, I think about this event as a legacy of activism, of movement building, of just scholarship that can go way back. You want to go to Du Bois, you can go to Du Bois. You want to go to Harriet Tubman, we can go. We can go way back. And so when I get questions about the event, about like the when how, this being the one and the only, and I'm constantly saying, no, we got BCAF, we got MechaCon, we got BlurredCon, we got so many people doing this work because it comes out of a lineage and legacy of, of this need. And so I'm curious, I, I would love to know like some of the scholars or critical thinkers who influenced you in your work to even, even as a young person that made you really think like, whoa, or even the art, because I don't want to just be restricted to scholarship. I want to think about like, what was an, ar an artistic piece or a figure, a historical figure maybe that helped you wake up and, or like think like, man, I got to see this differently and in a that enabled you to do this work. Let, let, let me jump in really quickly. I'll be really fast, and I'm so glad you, you can take time. We got no, 20 no, no. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I'm so glad you mentioned legacy because this event builds on the legacy of the Black Age in Chicago with Tertel only. This legacy, this event builds on the legacy of Egbach, East Coast Black Age of Comics uh, convention, which continues to the present, right, in Philadelphia. Right with Yumi Odom, this legacy builds on Onyx Con with uh, Joseph Wheeler, et cetera. And so, you know, I think it's important that we help people understand that, like many things, it is a continuum of what has happened in the past. And as you were talking, Katie, too, I, I started to think about some of what we see in mainstream, mm -hmm. mainstream, which uh, uh, Yumi Odom calls a Eurostream media uh, oh. today, which I wonder it would not have been possible. 10 years ago. So we think about Black Panther, the film. We think about the sequel. We think about The Watchmen. We think, and I'm just, the other series on HBO. Lovecraft? Yes, Lovecraft. 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 <laughs> or, or, or Naomi, they just started. N Naomi, Naomi, yes. right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, I, I wonder, this festival is part of that. I'm not sure, you know, how much we can claim 
but it certainly communicates to this broader audience that there is something legitimate. It's always been legitimate, whether you recognize it or not, but there's something legitimate, coherent, something historical, something longstanding, something important here. And so it is the stream of developing awareness of Black life, the representation of Black life. And, and I think that the idea of legacy that predates the festival and thinking about you know, the idea of futurism and what is to come, the festival is right in there. And so I think it's really important that we recognize that. Now, I'd, I'd like to, to speak to that really quickly, too, because we haven't answered Katie to his question yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, just really quickly. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you again, I keep, I talk about Afrofuturism. We have a whole Afrofuturism panel, I know. But comics are a huge part of, like, Black speculative culture, right? And if you look at, like, Mark Derry's original essay, uh, Black to the Future, it's illustrated with five images, four of which are from Black comics, by the way. One is uh, an image by Ramel Z, the uh, sculptor, hip hop uh, um, uh, master. Um, and so what I'm getting at is that comics have always been in that conversation, you know. But for some reason, people would turn a blind eye to it because maybe because it's low culture, maybe because they understand what's going on. But um, I think that this current iteration of like black speculative culture, which you know me and Renaldo Anderson called the the black speculative arts movement, right, pretty much started at the Schomburg, you know. Um, with you know a lot around around the uh, the um, the uh, the show that we did, the art show that we did, um, unveiling visions, unveiling visions, yeah, the, the alchemy of black imagination, uh, of black imagination, was kind of like a, a starting point for a lot of these ideas too. And I think, as Jonathan's saying, it's part of the the revolution that's coming back around because I I look at the fact that you know during the Harlem Renaissance, people were writing about speculative fiction, right? During the Black Arts Movement, we had people writing about speculative fiction. I think that it's always been part of like the conversation that we're having, and as Jonathan said, it's a legacy of wondering what Black futures will be like, and the radical notion of the fact that those Black futures are still like under siege to this day, right? And I think the comics give us a really um, uh, a, a really really powerful immediate response to what's going on on on, on a day to day basis, right? Now, as far as like artwork and things that, are, that I'm uh, or, or people or writers, um, I was always really influenced by uh, people from the Harlem Renaissance. So to, to the start to stand in that space where we actually have like some of the ashes of Langston Hughes buried under the, in the foundation <laughs> under a cosmogram. I mean, it's just it's incredible. On Linux Avenue, Malcolm X Boulevard is blickety, it's one of the blickety blackest spaces on the planet. You know, it's like it's like a black hole of creativity. And it's wonderful, right? So yeah, I mean, those one of my favorite things is the fact that you walk through the Schomburg and like Aaron Douglas paintings are like hanging off the walls, looking at you, these beautiful silhouettes he painted, right? I mean, we're part of that legacy, we're part of that creative legacy. And the fact that um to every movement that we've had, we've always had an artistic sister movement. We've always had a sister uh, cousin movement <laughs> that's actually like part of the revolution. So, you know, other people, of course, that inspired me, Octavia Butler and Dennis Cowan and, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Langston Hughes and W.B. Du Bois and Zora Neale Hurston. I mean, like these, these are all dreamers and fighters, you know, whose persistence, I think, are, it's just in our intellectual DNA, so. And I'll just toss into the legacy um, African-American children's literature, because for me, like as a kid of the early 70s, <laughs> um, that the movement. So this that was the parallel educational and artistic movement of the 1960s and 70s were these breakthrough artists and illustrators and storytellers who were getting published um, finally to tell uh, black stories in children's literature. And so for me as a kid and a consumer of those images, those were, you know, hotbeds of imagination for me. And you have like Leo and Diane Dillon and even Ezra Jack Keats with all his, his famous series mm -hmm. of stories. And then moving that into television, there's uh, the animator T. Collins, who did a lot of work for Sesame Street and Electric Company. And so there's this kind of transmedia, but I think a lot of it kind of stemmed or started, uh, is rooted in children's literature as well. That was a great point. I, um, my, my mind immediately went to one of my favorite children's books that for me just 
blew my mind wide open was um and I'm, I'm, I'm remiss of the author's name but uh the people could fly do you remember was that uh oh, Virginia, Virginia? yes yeah. I read that but I went to the library the Brooklyn Public Library picked up this book because it was the one time I ever saw the cover of a book have black people on it um and they were flying so clearly I was like this book is for me um <laughs> but I was just the storytelling it it just blew me away. It's still, I, I highly recommend it to everyone to this day, adults, children, everybody um, should be reading this test because it was the first time I can imagine, I can learn about a history, a, a time in history that was what we call difficult, which is a weird way to put it, mm -hmm. but, or hard history is what we're calling it now. Um, mm -hmm. But also learn about it, looking at like pure perseverance, resilience of a people, um, considering, you know, growing up in Brooklyn through hard times. It was just something that was so inspiring that just, I latched onto it. And the unfortunate thing is like, I, I, I lost some of that literature as I got a little older, like fortunately for events like the Black Comic Book Festival where we can introduce black, young black kids to these texts. I lost that when I got um, into my middle years, at least. I latched onto R.L. Stein, <laughs> like, which is, I love R.L. Stein, don't get me wrong. Okay. I love a Fear Street saga. Um, I read every single book, but I, I didn't realize the gap that was missing, that there were, there were black people writing these kinds of stories and with characters who looked like me. So I can actually see myself in those texts. So I really appreciate your point, Deidre, about also children's literature being a, as a, a space that also brings this event into fruition. Um, my next question, I'm curious, and because I know right now you're all working in academia in, in, in a degree of teaching at the same time. I'm curious, and, and John, my question is more about your role in publishing. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about, because you said something about like lowbrow, how comics, you know, previously were seen in this certain type of way. I'd love to hear how your work is expanding, how we use comics in the classroom space, in the academic spaces, but also for you, John, how are you pushing publishing and how publishers work with, you know, comics artists, black artists, independent artists? How are you all pushing this in your own respective areas? Oh yeah, definitely. So, so uh, what's interesting is I think because of the, some of the work with the festival and also just my own research, I, I found that, you know, working in, in an art program was actually very limiting for me. <laughs> I know that sounds wild, right? But a lot of times you get married to the thing that you train to be like for instance if you're a painter you become a painting professor you're just painting if you're a sculptor you're just sculpting right that kind of thing and I'm a, i was a graphic designer so i was designing right and then i realized that i as a designer i'm really more of a rhetorician like i'm thinking about visual rhetoric in a particular way and that comics used metaphor and like sociology anthropology um writing you know juxtaposition of different ideas the surreal nature of comics in just a really fascinating way. And it, and it really just kind of changed the way I saw what I was doing, right? And I realized that, you know, I had to have more agency in my own uh, research and my own career. So after tenure, I started moving into like a way more interdisciplinary space. And I, I've started doing like a lot of publishing super early. I mean, I remember, yeah, I've always had a hand in publishing in some way, you know, even, even as, a, as an independent uh, uh, creator. And so I even had a, a, a black theme, like free newspaper when I was in grad school called Black Thought. You know, so we have been, been publishing for a long time in, in one way or another. And um, what's happened, I think, fairly recently, uh, and this is actually on top of just looking at the amazing publishers that we work with, the vendors, every vendor is a publisher, right? Every vendor has like a particular um, way of seeing and, um, and pushing out the work. And also, too, I mean, to your point uh, early on um, about having to create spaces of agency, you know, this is something that the Black press actually taught us, you know, years ago. You know spaces like the Chicago Defender and you know uh, the Pittsburgh Courier and spaces like that. So it just made sense to me that we should actually have, try to have more agency around what we're putting out and how we're seeing ourselves. The kind of like spectrum of how we're seeing ourselves. So um, when we when me and Damian Duffy uh, started working on um, working with Octavia Butler's uh, um, estate, we were able to put together uh, um, this book Kindred that actually did really well and Abrams. Uh, it basically gave me an opportunity to, to start an imprint, you know, called Megascope. And I called it Megascope because I got it from this device that W.B. Du Bois put into his um, his short story, The, the Princess Steel. And so it's a, it's a device that can see through time and space and other dimensions and things like that. And it's like, it's almost like a cosmic Oculus Rift to a certain degree, <laughs> if you want to think about it like that. But this is something that was created in 1909 that he kind of gifted us. It was just sitting there in his papers. And I thought it'd be a wonderful name for 
um, an imprint, you know, and this new imprint is, is looking at people of color and speculation. So horror, science fiction, fantasy, what have you. And I think over the last decade or so, I've picked up the different skill sets to be, uh, you know, project manager uh, to, I, I'm a book designer, so I can actually know how to design books and actually, you know, I know a lot about like the production side of, of how books are made. And it just seemed a really good fit for me to work with Abrams uh, to kind of put out these stories. And so now, um, five books later, I mean, we, like we launched in the middle of a pandemic, please don't launch publishing endeavors in the middle of pandemics, but, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it's been pretty amazing. And so we're working on books like, you know, Afrofuturist version of The Count of Monte Cristo, for instance, is coming up. We're, you know, we're working on a, a, an adaptation of The Middle Passage by Charles Johnson, you know. We're working on a book about the Emmett Till case, but we're also working on like horror books for like Tanana Redu, Stephen Barnes. So we've been able to actually join like these, this, this kind of like the zeitgeist of, of like the Black Speck of Arts movement, Afrofuturist thought, the, the Black Age, and fuse it into like this new imprint, you know, and, and, and also too, we have a really, really robust uh, advisory board too. So some of the top scholars who work on comics are working with us to kind of put these things out because really comics are kind of like a nexus for different types of make making, you know. It's, all, it's a really amazing uh, medium that I think we're trying to like push into the, into the next phase. So yeah, I think, I hope to answer the question, but right now we're, you know, I'm in the middle of like just, um, I look at a lot of uh, a lot of new stories that are coming out. I'm trying to actually get people who are working in literary spaces, more literary spaces, to make comics, you know, so and, and to put them out for for it for new readers. So yeah, did that make sense? No, I that was bad. No, that does make sense. <laughs> oh, thank you, John. And Deidre, because I know. It's like, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I know it's so early for you, John. I mean, it's just like five o'clock, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad John's in California, so thank yeah, you. So so <laughs> So Deidre, I, I, the question came to me because I think about your the, the education work you've done, not only at the Schomburg Center, but at Columbia University. So you've taught courses using, you call what you call edu comics, um, which I think is so dope. Um, uh, I, so I really wanted to hear about how you're pushing educators and even academia to reconsider how they're teaching young people, how we consider literacy, um, just based on what, you, and even just representation as well, because your work, it's dynamic because it, it addresses all of those things in one at once, which is amazing. So I just want to hear about how you you've been navigating that, um, how you've been pushing boundaries with the work around comics and literacy, uh, just yeah, and your activism around that. Thank you. I think you're right. Just as John and and Jonathan have have signified, like it's such an interdisciplinary space, comics, right? And so when I approach it through my lens as an education scholar, like I'm dealing with historical literacy, racial literacies, visual literacies, and speculative ones, right? How are we getting young people, not just to think critically, but to think about themselves and our culture, you know, in a future tense that also references the past. And so comics kind of compound all of those things in really interesting ways, comics and graphic novels, and of course, animation as well. And so I find these materials are incredibly rich given these expert hands and visionaries who are creating them, they're incredibly rich teaching tools. Like, you know, as John signified, you know, he's working on a piece that's dealing with the Emmett Till case. And so we can teach civil rights history and American history through comics. Um, and we can teach about, you know, a kind of a past and a present and, and get our students, and I was working with college students who were reading these books, to even think, to reimagine the way they understand, you know, our, our diverse American culture through a Black perspective, right? Through a Black worldview, through Black voices. Um, and so it's a really powerful in that way. I mean, in education, we talk about multimodal learning, which is that kids need to read more than black text on white pages. <laughs> and so comics and graphic novels also serve that. And when you curate really excellent works because they're being produced, it's not all, you know, bubblegum comics. This is like serious stuff that's being produced. Um, you have not only the primary sources, the stories, you have all of the scholarship and the, you know, the, the critical scholarship that's talking about 
the content. So you have folks like Jonathan Gales and Kiana Witted and, and others who are writing about, you know, how these stories are creating, you know, larger conversations about Blackness and about womanness and about youth and uh, all kinds of things. And so I really, I'm trying to to push educators to see these works um, as really viable teaching uh, resources. But also through the Black Comics Collective, which just recently signed with Serendipity Literary uh, Agency, is pushing to just produce more works that will fill that middle grade and young adult uh, need for more stories for young people. And so I'm excited to be on that new venture as well. I want to say really quickly, um, because to you, uh, just kind of uh, to build on top of that, one of the things too, and I, and I really again, I have to, I, I have to thank like Deirdre and Jonathan for allowing me and Stacey to even rethink how Black Kirby functions in different spaces. You know, um, is that Black Kirby has now started doing these shows called they're called illustrated syllabuses, so we call it an illibus essentially. And so we're thinking about like, uh, cause Stacy just wrote a, a piece about it. I think for, for a piece of Deirdre helped him write for, you know, as far as one of the journals. Uh, and uh, it's basically looking at like taking the gallery space and, and really, really pushing the idea of it being a, a teaching space, you know? And so instead of like walking into a, an exhibition, you're actually walking into a classroom, you know, you're walking into a, an actual syllabus. So we would actually put up the different images around a particular subject as uh, the text that needs to be unpacked. And then actually have prompts that are actually installed in the show that actually are that are week by week prompts that you can actually uh, talk about in the space. And then also we have a we have a, a bibliography. It, we'd have a bibliography installed in the space, and that practice actually came out of the unveil unveiling vision show that we did. And so over the over the years, we've actually you know come up with like different strategies to actually like create a gallery space that's actually for the community, but also is teaching in these different ways. And so, and, it, and it's because, you know, the UCR has allowed us to actually use a gallery space as like kind of a laboratory to kind of you know, do these things. So, so I'm really thankful for those experiences. And, and I really like the idea of like the gallery as a teaching space. And I think that's come out of, you know, working with the festival, but also working with these really, really community-minded gallery spaces. Yeah, and can, can I jump in really quickly? Yeah. Um, I just want to mention something and, and, and build on something that uh, Deidre said, this idea of, of these kinds of intersections. And I think sometimes people misunderstand, for example, my documentary, they, they describe it as a, a comic book documentary. Well, the documentary isn't about comic books. It's about the representations of Black masculinity in comic books. And a lot of this work gives us an opportunity to use comic books to examine people create comic books. People are influenced by these ideas, narratives, tropes, stereotypes um, that allow them or require them to create certain scripts, so to speak. And, and so, you know, we are increasingly living in a nation in which affirming Black life itself, uh, the, uh, the act of affirming Black life is regarded as being subversive. Mm -hmm. So to, to bring in Jerry Kraft, one of the co-founders, his second book, I mean, award-winning books now, his second book was banned in Texas. Right. Yeah. And so if we understand then the way in which, yes, we are talking about comic books, we are talking about graphic novels, but we're also talking about the idea of, of affirming Black life. Yeah. And to the extent that we are able to do that, we make things better for, for all, I believe, all of us. So I, I think it's important for us to recognize that that is one of the critical components of this festival the the movements that preceded it and the movements that would fo will follow it it's ultimately also about the importance of affirming black life and we are increasingly living in a space where where it is difficult and perhaps even perhaps even dangerous to do that and i live in people forget atlanta is in georgia you understand and so you know that that resonates in in certain ways for me no i can't thank you enough for making that comment jonathan um I thought there was something I read recently on just, I, I was reading a response on just about re reflection on Bell Hooks and her work um, and how she got a whole, someone was like, she got a whole generation just to think differently. Like mm -hmm. she got a generation of people to just think differently. And so not only in addition to 
you know, how do we affirm Black life, but how do we also deeply affirm Black imagination? So we're talking like, I know Deidre, we, we love, we throw the word psyche around a lot, like the Black psyche, like how are, how, how are we tending to our imaginations? How are we tending to this, our intellectuality? How are we attending to the way we see the world and think of ourselves and even imagine ourselves beyond our current situations? I, I, I pull in Afrofuturism for that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I want to, on a personal note from you all, how do you sustain your imagination? Because you're deeply creative people. I know Jonathan, you're not a, you know, you don't, you don't, put, you know, crayon to paper, but it's, right. you were, I consider you an artist, you're masterful in, in the work that you're doing. And so I would love to know how, how you all as individuals, because it, I, I don't want to neglect the reality of this pandemic and how hard it's been on so many folks just to feel hopeful um, and at the same time, take time to rest, right? And recalibrate and really slow down and think about what it is we need, what we want for ourselves, what we want for each other. But that imagination work is, for me, I, I find it very hard to do when you're constantly just going and, and working and to have artists, have scholars like you all who, who do it and are sustained in a way by it. I'm curious to know what's your relationship to imagination, but how do you sustain that imagination, especially in a time like this, I think this is a selfish question. Um, <laughs> to be very, to be very transparent, <laughs> um, because you know John is out here just like dropping books like that, and you know Jonathan's got these classes and these these papers. Deidre's Deidre's got another course coming up uh, at Columbia, and I'm just like, how do you all, you know, keep going? Like, how do you sustain yourselves? And that imagination. I'm just give me the give me the recipe, y'all. Just give me I, the, the the secrets. Is what I, I'm asking. I don't, I don't know if there's a recipe, you know, but <laughs> I, I'll tell you what I've, what I've certain things that I've noticed with my own practices. First of all, you know, in the academy, you know, you're always forced to kind of break down what you do into like these categories, right? You know, everything in the university is about categories, you know. And, uh, even the nomenclature is about separation. We have departments, and we have programs, and we have siloed you know uh, uh ways of thinking and it's like it's funny because like the university is supposed to be like one right but it's actually extremely mm -hmm. you know separated you know so you know me i, I was like I, I ignore that first of all so okay i intentionally jump across different ways it, it drives my administrators crazy sometimes actually <laughs> but it's like it's part of it's part of staying staying active is to is to join all those different practices your your teaching and pedagogy and your and your 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 uh, creative work and also your service into one thing you know first of all it's like so everything that i do is like one part is a holistic idea you know it's not they can they can try to categorize it but i'm just doing the thing that i'm supposed to do but in different ways so you you have to learn how to like shift the, your thinking to to fit whatever the nuances that they need to be um I was I used, when I was teaching design. I was to tell my students I don't teach in a design program. I teach in a design deprogram, right? Because there's a lot of ways that we actually we we, we have to teach students how, how to how to how to how to learn better. You know, listen, thing. say that you know, how to learn better. Have to understand like, okay, this is how you learn. This is how you. I want to know what you think about these things. You know, and sometimes my students have never been asked about their opinion at all. You know, and so now I have I teach. I teach three courses on Afrofuturism, one on a race and horror. I teach one on uh, aesthetics and Afrofuturism and one on like just the politics of black superheroes. And, and then also a, a course on comics and, uh, and contemporary culture. And I have teach mostly black and brown students and they're in this space in a, in a class that is centered around them. And they, they're like, what, wait a minute. It's like, everything's about me. As far as like the imagination, I think, you know, I can't turn it off. See, I, I, have the, I don't have like writer's block. I have the opposite. And which is really maddening. It's like a cacophony of stories that have to assault me on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, my biggest fear is that I'm going to die and not have half the stories that are, that are living inside me out there. Which is why, even with an imprint, you know, I could actually just populate it with the things that are in my head right now. <laughs> it's it's so wild. I don't have writer's block. I don't. I have the opposite. I I have. Uh, uh, I'm cursed with stories, you know what I'm saying? And I, you know, blessed and cursed, you know, it's, it's, um, it's maddening. And I'm also, I love collaborating. That's the other thing too. So, you know, I collaborate like, like, uh, like a lot to the point where, again, it's hard to measure like what part is mine, what part is some of that, that drives administrators crazy too. Like, wait, what percentage did you, of this book did you write? I was like, I don't know anymore. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> 
who cares? Oh, you care? Okay, well, this is my job. Okay, we got to figure this out then. Anyway, um, but yeah, so that I, I don't I don't necessarily have a, the best answer for you, but I'm an artist, you know, I'm a storyteller. And in the classroom, I'm a storytelling artist. As a, as a community servant, I'm a storytelling artist. I'm always that. It just depends on, um, you know, what lens you're looking at me through, you know? And uh, yeah, so that's, I, so my advice would be like to figure out like what that thing is and merge all the different strands of what you do into one thing so they feed each other, you know? Yeah, as far as like imagination, I think that the Black Radical Imagination of from Robin D.G. Kelly is persistent, beautiful, ever-changing, um, and vital, particularly now, because again, you know, Afrofuturism, to borrow from, La from, from Lisa Gazik, is rewriting the history of the future. You know, if you, if you look at like 1950s, there were no people, <laughs> it's like, you know, maybe, I don't, like, where are we, right? So we have to actually, it's a radical notion to be Black and live, you know? It's a mundane thing, to borrow from Martin Sims, and black, it's, a, it's a mundane Afrofuturism that we're looking at. Like, how do we get by, right? And sometimes we have to imagine ourselves in a better space to get there, right? Dr. King was an Afrofuturist. He was a Black speculative writer. You know, that mountaintop that he's talking about does not exist. It's not on your Google Maps. It's not on your map quests. We haven't gotten there yet. It's still a, it's still a, a, it's a magnet of space. And we, maybe, we can, maybe we can comic book it to, into, into life. I have no idea. But I, I'm going to die telling, trying to, to tell my truth and actually like draw and 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 write and help others make that 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 jump you know you know that that's that's what i'm dedicated to jonathan uh, i'll say really quickly for me it's it's thinking about my daughters and what do they need to see when they look in the mirror mm -hmm. and to what degree can i do the work that makes sure that they see what they need to see not necessarily what they want to see Right, because what they want to see reflects these scripts that we've been mentioned that that we've mentioned, and so for me that is the source of my energy. That's the source of my imagination, and and it is something that uh, I can't shake and I don't want to shake. Yeah. So I share the same things that both John and Jonathan said. Um, thinking about my son, thinking about my students, because I'm a I'm an educator. I'm a you know I'm a convener. I want to to get the stories to readers, you know? That's why I started the Black Comics Collective. But in a more pragmatic sense, it's, it's the community of creators that keep me inspired. So like just to the right of the computer screen is my stack of books <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, between the scholarly is I'm reading, <laughs> I'm reading all of these incredible Black stories that are out there that feature us and center us and keep me loving not just the medium but keep me like in this culture you know i love it so that's what keeps me inspired i appreciate you all just inspired me thank you so <laughs> so much i'm actually rereading du bois uh, the souls of black folk for like the seventh time and every single time like you said john you put you mentioned du bois but every single time you read some of these writers they just reveal something new to you because you're in a different context a different time like it's it's always so i found a lot of inspiration by reaching back to history and and learning from my ancestors yes. so and learning from you all so thank you so much um to close i realized i did not even go to audience questions i am selfish i apologize y'all i promise i'm gonna get it right for the next panel but as we close can you all let us know where to find your work where to find you if, if we can follow you on social media if you're not on social media it's all right but let us know where we can find your work um, I'm at John, my, my website is John Jennings Studio, all one word, .com, and all of my handles are there in the, uh, the media section. But again, that's one word, John Jennings Studio .com. And you can find me at Black Comics Collective on all platforms, Black Comics with an S Collective. And you can also check out a new NFT project John and I are doing at burn1.today. Great, and you can uh, find all of my information at my website, jonathangales.com. Beautiful. 
Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Deidre. Thank you, John. And in spirit, thank you, Jerry. I'm deeply appreciative for all of this amazing conversation. For you all watching, thank you for joining us for this conversation. Again, this is our 10th annual Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg Center. We're coming to you virtual, but still lit, okay? So it's live over here in my Brooklyn apartment. So I really want you all to, to stay, stay in tune with us. Follow us at shamcom.org for updates about programming that is happening for the next three, two, three days, right? Um, our next program is at 2 p.m. It's called Graphic History, telling our stories, our histories through comics and the archives, featuring Bridget Pride, one of our incredible librarians here at the Schomburg Center, Dr. Rebecca Hall, author of Wake, and lastly, David Walker, the author of The Black Panther Party. So thank you so much, and we'll see you a little later. Greetings, I'm Mau Mau, Sheriff of Pure Heart Valley, and my superpower is <laughs> swordsmanship. Great job, Sheriff, you're my hero! <laughs> oh, yes, Adorabat, I know. Dance, take the chance.